Last week on this show, I mentioned in passing something that I called the Michael Knowles Public Health Protection Pledge. What I said was, I would not vote for any candidate for federal office in 2022 who did not sign a pledge agreeing to two things. One, subpoena and investigate Anthony Fauci for his incompetence and deception and potential corruption on COVID. And two, zero out his salary. Maybe you can't fire him exactly if you're in Congress, but you can have the power of the purse and zero out that salary. So those two promises had to be met in order to get my vote. And I said, you shouldn't vote for people who refused to sign on to that either. So then a congressional candidate, Bo Hines, came out and he said, hey, Michael, I love the pledge. I had my staff write it up and I signed on to it. I said, well, Bo, that's awesome, man. So I posted it. A bunch of dozens of other congressional candidates signed on as well. But there weren't incumbents. Where were the sitting members of Congress? Very often, incumbent politicians don't want to sign on to pledges because they don't want to have to be held accountable. So I said, okay, well, we'll see. Just, you know, look, this is the bare minimum, I think, for any Republican running for federal office. If you don't realize what a danger Dr. Fauci is and everything Dr. Fauci represents and the power he wields, if you don't recognize what a threat that is to self-government, then you're useless. I'm not going to vote for you. You don't deserve our vote. I get a message yesterday, two days ago, from Congressman Paul Gosar, very strong conservative, rock-ribbed kind of Republican, willing to stand up. He says, Michael, I've just uh, introduced the Michael Knowles Public Health Protection Pledge into Congress as an official House resolution. Here we have House Concurrent Resolution 71, expressing the sense of Congress the Congress should issue a subpoena to Dr. Anthony Fauci and reduce the salary of the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and chief medical advisor to the president. Uh, resolved by the House of Representatives, the Senate concurring. It is the sense of Congress that one, Congress should issue a subpoena to Dr. Fauci with the intent of investigating A, the extent of any corrupt activities to which he may be party with respect to COVID-19 and B, the deception, misinformation, and numerous lies reported to Congress and the American people throughout the COVID pandemic. And two, the Speaker of the House of Representatives should reinstate the Holman rule. The Holman rule is the rule that allows Congress to go in and zero out salaries of particular bureaucrats. Uh, reinstate the Holman rule and provide expeditious consideration of legislation that reduces the salary of aforementioned Dr. Fauci to zero dollars and zero cents. Here it is, baby. Made it all the way to Congress. This is the federal public health protection pledge. It is there. Your congressman can co-sponsor this right now. I want you to go where, whatever platform you're listening on, whatever platform you're watching on, go out, tag your member of Congress, email your member of Congress, tell him to sign on as a co-sponsor and together we can rid ourselves of that power mad, dishonest, incompetent technocrat tyrant, Anthony Fauci. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. My favorite comment yesterday from Chuck Silver, who says, Joe is just cleaning out Hunter's bedroom closet and doesn't know what to do with all the crack pipes. So he's giving them away. That's, you know, it's recycling. It's very environmentally friendly. Maybe this is part of the green agenda too. Who knows? Who knows? We, people have a lot of things in their home to protect, not just whatever was in that closet, but lots of other things to protect, especially your family, which is why you got to go check out Ring. You all know about the Ring Video Doorbell. You know because I've told you about it for many years. That's that amazing doorbell where you can see and speak to whoever is at your doorstep, whether you're in the house, whether you're at the office, whether you're on a beach on the other side of the world. Did you know that Ring also makes an alarm? Ring Alarm is an award-winning home security kit with available professional monitoring. Best of all, you can easily install it yourself. I find it so simple that even I can do it, which is really, really amazing. You get notified right on your phone whenever anything is detected. I, I really, really, really like Ring. It not only makes me feel safe when I'm away and sweet little Lisa and the baby are home, but even when we're all away. And, and you're not just protecting your home against the bad guys. You're protecting your home against flood, freeze, and fire too. Head on over right now, get Ring's award-winning professional monitoring. Go to ring.com slash Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S. That is ring.com slash Knowles to get a great deal on a Ring Alarm Home Security Kit today. Ring.com slash Knowles. 
The crack pipe story is the single funniest political story I have seen in years. The fact that the government is promising to advance racial equity by giving out crack pipes is just so freaking funny. I can't handle it. It has become a major political firestorm for the Biden White House. A lot of Biden officials now have had to come out, issue clarifications, have emergency press conferences. Let's check in right now uh, with the director of the Department of Health and Human Services. You with them magic markers, what you think this is? Some kind of cram? No, take that cap off and sniff it and you'll be high. These little ones are 10 and 11 years old. You, you know what dog food tastes like, do you? It tastes just like it smells. Delicious. There, there he is, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Tyrone Biggins. It would make sense now. The policy now makes sense. I, who, we could never have guessed that the secretary would be a crackhead himself. Uh, the other Biden officials, uh, Secretary Xavier Becerra, other science advisors at the White House, they've come out and they've said, no, this, no, no crack pipes. But the wording is so careful here. The White House denied that there was ever a policy to give out crack pipes. The Secretary of Health and Human Services was a little more careful because the fact is there was a policy to give out crack pipes, uh, but now they obviously don't want that policy. So he said, quote, no federal funding will be used directly or through subsequent reimbursement of grantees to put pipes in safe smoking kits. So he's not denying that there was going to be federal funding for the crack pipes. He's just saying, look, now we are not going to have, there will not be crack pipes in the crack smoking kits, which raises a question. How does the government expect the crackheads to smoke the crack without the crack pipes? If the, if the point of the policy is to give out safe smoking kits, how are you going to smoke if you don't have the single most important instrument for smoking? I mean that sincerely. It, what it shows you is that they're just scrambling right now. They don't have an explanation. The other ways they could, I guess they could include rolling papers. I don't think you smoke crack with, I don't know. I don't have experience with this, but even if it were rolling papers, you, you don't need rolling papers as a matter of public health, right? It's not as though people are going around sharing rolling papers. You, once you use the rolling papers, you, they're gone, they're burnt up. So it's, you wouldn't, wouldn't be that. They could be giving tobacco leaves to roll big fat blunts, I guess. I don't, again, I don't know. This is not my area of expertise, but again, that would burn up. They could give out bongs. I don't know. Do you smoke crack in a bong? Well, that would be a pipe too. And they're saying there are no pipes in the safe smoke. How can you call it a smoking kit, safe or otherwise, if it doesn't include the thing that you need to smoke? This, this smoking kits include all sorts of other things as well, but, but those other things all kind of relate back to the pipe. So they're very confused over there at the White House. The most incredible thing about this whole crackhead episode is how desperately all of the different facets of the political establishment, by which I'm, I'm including the media, I'm including big tech here, obviously the government, how they're all working together to try to tamp down this story because it's generating tons of bad press, t- tons of bad press from us, from the conservatives over this, tons of bad, tons of jokes from ordinary people about this. My wife right now, <laughs> my wife is, is uh, traveling and seeing her family. She's at a hotel right now. She said this morning, she wa- walks outside and she hears one hotel worker say to another hotel worker, hey man, you hear we're all about to get some free crack pipes in the mail? <laughs> And they're all, all laughing about this. So Biden and his entire administration is a laughing stock. The establishment is going into overdrive to, to try to tamp this down. Notably, the fact-checking website, Snopes. Fact-checking is, it's not actually fact-checking. It's just a way that the left rebranded leftist opinion columns maybe 10 or 11 years ago to try to make them absolutely incontrovertible. So it would have, it would just be regular left-wing opinion columns, but they'd say, this is a fact check. Fact check. Republicans are wrong about everything. 10 Pinocchios, facts, right? So Snopes 
adjudicates the claim. The claim is in early 2022, the Biden administration endeavored to advance racial equity by distributing crack pipes to users. Mostly false, Snopes says. Okay, well, what's true? What's false? Snopes says, what's true? In 2022, a U.S. Department of Health and Human Services substance abuse harm reduction grant did require participants to provide safer smoking kits to existing drug users. Huh. Okay, so it sounds... It sounds like the crack pipe thing is true, but okay, it goes on and says, in distributing the grants, priority would be given to applicants serving historically underserved communities. Okay, so it's, however, okay, what's false? What's false is this was just one of a, around 20 components of the grant program and far from its most prominent or important one, despite being the primary focus of outrage news reports. Hold on, so you're telling me it's true. It's true that Biden was sending crack pipes to people. But, but Biden was also doing other things. So therefore it's not true that, but you just said it's true that he did that. We're not saying he didn't ever do any other things. I'm sure he had breakfast too. We're not, but he did this, right? Okay. What about the racial equity part? The, well, Snope says what's false. The purpose of the program was to reduce harm and the risk of infection among drug users, not to advance racial equity. Although that was a secondary consideration. So you're saying that was a purpose of it. <laughs> the two claims here were Biden's sending out crack pipes and it, he's doing it to advance racial equity. And you're saying, what's true? All of that. What's false? None of that. It's all just completely true. Therefore, we conclude mostly false. 75 Pinocchios. Please, Republicans, stop making fun of us. They just, the establishment needs some relief. And when you need relief, I would strongly recommend you check out Relief Band. Did you know that one out of three Americans regularly suffer from nausea? We have all experienced that horrible feeling, whether it's in the backseat of a car, staring at your phone, after uh, one too many Coca-Colas on a night out with friends, or even just the anxiety of a workday. You've got to check out Relief Band. It's the number one FDA cleared anti-nausea wristband that has been clinically proven to quickly relieve and effectively prevent nausea and vomiting associated with motion sickness, anxiety, migraines, hangovers, morning sickness, chemotherapy, and a lot more. The technology was originally developed over 20 years ago in hospitals to relieve nausea from patients. Now, through Relief Band, it's available to everyone. The product is 100% drug-free, non-drowsy. It provides all-natural, long-lasting relief with zero side effects for as long as needed. Uh, they just released their newest model, Relief Band Sport. The Sport is waterproof, has an extended battery life, can even attach to your Apple or Android watch. Go get it right now. They make a great gift any time of year. Getting an exclusive offer just for our listeners. If you go to reliefband.com, use promo code Knowles, get 20% off plus free shipping and a no questions asked 30-day money back guarantee. Best offer you'll find for Relief Band anywhere. Got to use my code R-E-L-I-E-F-B-A-N-D.com, promo code Knowles for 20% off plus free shipping. It's unbelievable to look at the, I, I hope people take a screenshot of, of this page on Snopes. They'll need to because they've already changed it. It was not only were we in a position where the Biden policy was the mockery of the entire country, but then the desperate attempts by the establishment to alternately deny and defend the policy, right? On the one hand, they say this isn't happening. It's not true. But on the other hand, yes, it's also, it's great. It's good. It's very important to, to do that. Uh, that that became the mockery too. And so Snopes had to just completely, completely change course. And they did. They now say it's outdated. This is the new Snopes conclusion here. Outdated context after a wave of grossly misleading news coverage in February, 2022, the U.S. Health and uh, Department of Health and Human Services stipulated that federal funding would not be used to include pipes in safe smoking kits as part of substance abuse harm reduction program. This newly stipulated detail was not originally available. <laughs> yeah, because it wasn't true then. They changed their mind and backtracked because it was a laughing stock, meaning the assertions made in a first wave of coverage had become outdated. They're not outdated. They're not. They're not. The claim is in early 2022, the Biden administration tried to advance racial equity by sending out crack pipes. That remains true. Even though Biden ditched the ridiculous laughing stock policy, that still happened. You can't deny that that happened, Snopes. Well, they're trying to deny that it happened, but it did. It's so funny. If you read the original Snopes report, after they say this wasn't really true, they, they then go to defend the policy. They say it's perfectly logical. 
as a matter of harm reduction to send crack pipes to drug addicts. I don't know what definition of logical they're working. It doesn't seem logical to me to send crackheads crack pipes. But they say, no, it's great. It's, it's, not, it's both not happening and it's awesome that it's happening. And now they say it never happened at all. Forget about it. Why are they doing this? A lot of people are scratching their heads. Why? Why walk into this? Why is Snopes tying itself into these, these illogical pretzels to try to defend and deny this Biden policy? There's a real purpose. It's not just because they really like Joe Biden. It's not just because there are leftists at Snopes. The reason they're doing this is to censor conservatives who are making fun of the policy. Because Snopes and other leftist fact-checking websites are used by social media directly through the algorithms of these social media companies to suppress what they call misinformation, which in this case is just called information, just (laughs) truthful information about the policy. So what happens is if you post on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or Google or whatever, if you post about this policy and Snopes has come in there and said, this is a false claim. Yeah, we acknowledge it's all true, but we rate it mostly false. Then social media companies will suppress what you're writing. If a website, if a news website like the Daily Wire publishes articles about this policy, this very real policy. And Snopes comes in and says, no, even though everything they say is true, we write it mostly false. The website's going to get dinged. The website's going to show up less on search engines. The website's going to get much less play on social media. The website's traffic is going to collapse. The website's money is going to, it's just a way to censor and suppress conservatives. And so we can laugh at them. We'd say, oh, Snopes, you look like a bunch of idiots just carrying water, saying things that are obviously untrue. But Who's getting the last laugh on this? It's actually the left. It's actually the Democrats who are getting the last laugh because they are pretty effectively suppressing conservatives on the internet. Speaking of censorship on the internet, you know, Donald Trump, very sadly, was kicked off of social media while he was still the duly elected sitting president of the United States. These big tech oligarchs censored him, just booted him from the public square. And so we don't get all of his charming and wonderful tweets all the time. What he is doing now is releasing press releases that then all the rest of us tweet around and the press releases read like tweets. So Trump has weighed in on this issue, which is obviously close to his heart, social media censorship. He's weighed in on the censorship of Joe Rogan. He says, quote, Joe Rogan is an interesting and popular guy, but he's got to stop apologizing to the fake news and radical left maniacs and lunatics. How many ways can you say you're sorry? Joe, just go about what you do so well and don't let them make you look weak and frightened. That's not you and it never will be. I have said for a long time, Donald Trump is a poet. I don't, I don't even mean that as a joke or hyperbole. He has a very good sense of language. He does. When he said he's got the best words, folks, he was sort of right. He's a branding genius. The phrase, make America great again, which he borrowed from Reagan, but people had forgotten the phrase, is a very effective slogan, make America great again. This is generally strong Saxon words, make America, you know, it's the name of the country, great again. It's just, it gives you an image. And here, when he says the radical left maniacs and lunatics, it just paints a picture for you. When Donald Trump would would talk about low energy Jeb, little Marco, all these, it would paint a picture for you. And so that's what he's doing here. He's saying, Joe, don't give in. These people are nuts. They're insane. They're fringy. Don't give it. Don't be frightened. Don't be weak. That's not you. Don't do it. Unfortunately, though, Joe Rogan does not appear to want to become the new conservative standard bearer. Okay. He doesn't need to be. The guy, he's never styled himself a conservative. He's a comic who is on the left. He he was a Bernie Sanders supporter. So, okay, that's fine. You don't want to be the conservative standard bearer. I get it. I get it. I sort of thought there was a chance he he might be, if for no other reason than because he saw how corrupt the liberal establishment is. He saw when they just, when CNN lied about him and said that he was eating horse dewormer, and he said, I'm obviously not doing that. What are you, how are you telling these egregious lies about me? without any shame whatsoever. So I was kind of hoping, but it's probably not going to happen. Rogan had been offered a $100 
$1.5 million contract by Rumble, a conservative outlet, to leave Spotify. This is the letter from the CEO of Rumble. Said, look, I get it. One of the reasons Rogan's trying to save the Spotify deal is because Spotify's paying him $100 million. That's a lot of money. So, you know, easy for you and I to say that maybe we would leave. But, you know, what about Rogan? He's got to feed his family. He could feed a small army with, uh, with $100 million. So Rumble comes in. They say, we're going we're gonna to match it. Dollar for dollar, we're going to match it. $100 million bucks over four years. This is a totally legit deal. Do you want it or not? I thought it was the perfect offer. It would have allowed Rogan to be, be the best version of the Joe Rogan show, which is uncensored, just conversations with everybody, really engaging content. Uh, but he said, look, Spotify stuck by me, sort of, and so I'm not, I'm not going to do that. And moreover, if he'd gone to Rumble, it would have, it would have put him much more in a clearly defined right-wing space. He doesn't want to do that, apparently. Too bad. Would have been great. They're going to continue to censor him. They're already censoring, what, over a hundred of Joe's episodes. They're already putting disclaimers and warnings on his episodes with conservatives, not on the ones with liberals, just on the ones with conservatives. So that's too bad. I, I wish him well. I hope that he can survive this. I hope he can maintain the freedom of his show. But I'm, I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical. If, if the libs can rewrite the crackhead policy, if the libs can censor Donald Trump, the duly elected sitting president. They've got a lot of power, okay? And it would be it would be a shame for the Joe Rogan show, this kind of unique, hugely successful show, to just become another another podcast that falls in line with with what the establishmentarians tell us to do. It would be it would be sad if it were to get censored. Now, some things should be censored, and one of those things that should be censored is an Adidas ad that came out yesterday, took over the internet, got everyone talking about it, which I guess was the point. I'm talking about it. We're all talking about it. It was an ad that just showed lots and lots of boobs. So I saw this, saw this going around. They said, oh, Adidas is just showing a lot of breasts, dozens of breasts in their ad. And I, I did not search for it. I did not look at the ad because I thought, Look, if I look at this, this could be an occasion of sin, right? If I'm going to look at this ad that I'm being told is just a bunch of boobs, then that might arouse impure thoughts in my mind that I might willfully be under. I don't want to do that. Okay. That would be, I don't want an occasion of sin because I, I looked at this Adidas ad, but then look, I had to cover it. Everyone was talking about it. So I said, okay, I'll look at it very quickly. I am happy Maybe, I'm maybe happy to report the ad is not an occasion of sin because the, the picture, the pictures don't look great. Okay. I don't, I don't want to be offensive to the models and it's not, they didn't, the, the, the modeling community is not sending their best. The Adidas ad was physically about as unattractive as an ad could be. They, they, I think they need to hire a new advertising team over there. When you want to hire new employees, I would recommend you go check out ZipRecruiter. According to the latest research, 90% of employers plan to make enhancing the employee experience a top priority in 2022. A, a happy workplace is key to attracting and keeping great employees. Uh, we're talking about focusing on company culture. We're talking about allowing more flexibility in work schedules. In my own case, Ben has promised that he will send me a paycheck now, which is great. That would be a great change of, of course. If you need to add more employees to your team, there is ZipRecruiter. Their matching technology helps you find the right people for your roles fast. Right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S. ZipRecruiter uses powerful matching technology to find those candidates for your job. Then it proactively presents the candidates to you. We're not just talking about throwing spaghetti at the wall here. We're talking about going out, getting you the best candidates. Right now, you can find the right employees for your workplace with ZipRecruiter. Try it for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash Knowles. That is ZipRecruiter.com slash K-N-W-L-E-S. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. You know, tonight is a huge night for The Daily Wire. Why? Not only is it the world premiere of our first original film, Shut In, but we will also be releasing two new teaser trailers 
for new movies that we've got coming out this year. It's not just, we did our first movie, Run, Hide, Fight. We've now got this movie, Shut In. We got a lot more movies coming, okay? We could not be more excited to be making good on our promise of bringing you real entertainment. We really hope you tune in. Check out the trailer for Shut In. daughter. She's very pretty. I'm scared. The movie premieres tonight, February 10th at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central over at the Daily Wire YouTube channel after this month's episode of Backstage, which starts at 7.30 Eastern, 6.30 Central. Make sure to click the link in the description and turn on the notification bell so you do not miss it. We will be right back with a lot more. Adidas, the sneaker company, and I guess they, I assume they make bras or sports bras or say, otherwise this ad would make no sense. They are now advertising their product by, by publishing intentionally ugly looking boobs, uh, uncensored, you know, free the nipple, just totally out there. On the one hand, what's good is that it's not, I don't think it's going to arouse lustful thoughts in anybody. I, the, not that it's not, I don't think so. I would bet, I would bet a lot of money on that. But on the downside, it is participating in something that I'm noticing pretty much every company participating in now, which is a fascination with ugly things. I'm not even, I'm not saying these women are ugly even, but the photos are intentionally trying to make them look as ugly as they can. They're not, in, in the old days, back when I was a young whippersnapper growing up, models were really, really hot. You'd look, look around at billboards and it was the hottest women you could possibly see in magazines, in all advertisements. In fact, editors would go in and take already extremely beautiful women and then try to touch them up and airbrush and do this and that to make them look even more beautiful. Companies sold their products by associating the products with beauty. Now, it's almost always the opposite. They're always trying to associate their products with ugliness, with deformities, with grotesque images, with obscenity. With, it's, a, it's a cult of ugliness. It's, I guess a, 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 an analogy here would be how in, in the olden days when we studied history, we would try to, or, or literature for that matter, so much of education would be focused on beautiful things, right? You would focus on good things, not t- to the entire dis- exclusion of bad things and ugly things, but you would, you would focus on good things and on beauty. Now it's always the opposite. All you ever focus on in history are the sins and the imperfections and the failures. All you ever focus on in literature is ugliness and fallenness and anti-heroes. That's all you're getting in the culture. There's no, it's all just, it's all just yuck. <laughs> That's all we're getting. This is a big problem in our, you know, it was one of the best things Donald Trump did in his presidency, though it probably won't have much of an effect. He signed an executive order saying that we need to make federal buildings beautiful again. The federal buildings in Washington, D.C., for much of our nation's history, were really beautiful. And they were built in a beautiful style of architecture. And they were big and grand and awe-inspiring. And now they're ugly. They're just gross. They're brutalist. And they're intentionally incongruous. And they're just ugly. And they make you feel small. In New York, in the old Penn Station, you would walk in, you'd feel like a king. It was huge. It was beautiful. It was in, in these beautiful, this beautiful Beaux-Arts style. Then they knocked it down and, and built up Madison Square Garden. And the new Penn Station makes you feel like a little rat. It makes you feel small and dirt. And you don't, it's not good. It's not good when you have a society living in ugliness all the time. But we've lost a sense of what's beautiful. Great example of this, a, a Russian security guard just got in trouble for allegedly destroying a million dollar painting. It was a million dollar painting of of these blank faces 
like an ugly drawing that a three, a third grader could do. And there were blank faces and the board security guard took his pen and he put little eyes on the, on the blank faces. <laughs> <laughs> but it destroyed the value of the painting was worth a million dollars. And now the painting is worth nothing. The security guard did not destroy the painting because the painting was already ugly. It was already modern art. You can, you can tell me that, um, you know, a, a urinal in the middle of a museum is really beautiful art. You can tell me that it's really, really valuable, but it's not beautiful. It's hard even to call it art. It's not, it's ugly. It's stupid. It's pointless. And so much of our art now is not beautiful. In the security guard's defense, how was he supposed to know that this this drawing that an eight-year-old could do was worth a million dollars because people in that marketplace have lost their minds? How was he supposed to? You couldn't tell the difference between an elementary school art project and this million-dollar painting. I promise you that this security guard, if he were guarding the Sistine Chapel, would not have been confused. This security guard, I don't think that if he were guarding the Mona Lisa, he would have gone in and and drawn a mustache on the Mona Lisa. He would have recognized, I suspect, that these are beautiful things. These are great works of art. But the stupid million dollar doodle in the Russian museum, I don't know how you, I'm not saying that if you're a security guard, you should probably not be drawing on the walls to begin with. But there is a real difference between beauty and ugliness. And we used to have a standard that would recognize beauty and we would pursue it and we would encourage it in our public spaces and in our private spaces. And now we don't. Now we do completely the opposite. And it is, it it actually does have something to do with the degradation of society. When you don't, when you don't have a society looking up, being filled with awe, imbued with beauty, then you're going to have an ugly society. I was, I, I was walking around France some time ago. I was in a little towns in France and you go in, I got so sad. Because you're, you're in the countryside of France and you go into these churches and they're, they're not cathedrals. They're not even basilicas. Really. They're just churches, but they're big and they're beautiful and they're huge and they're awe-inspiring and, they're, and they make sense. And, and you think, why don't we have those? Why do we only build ugly things? Why did we give up on that? Really, really sad. Speaking of standards, some good news coming out of Congress for the first time in a while. Republicans are dropping their support of the Fairness for All Act. This is one of these ridiculously named bills. What what the Fairness for All Act would effectively do is completely redefine sex and obliterate the distinction between men and women. And it was not the Democrats supporting this bill. It was the Republicans. You see, the Democrats are supporting something called the Equality Act. And what the Equality Act says is we're going to redefine sex for purposes of civil rights, for purposes of federal law, We're going to say that sex is, we're going to protect sexual orientation and gender identity. So if you in any way suggest that a man is not really a woman, you're violating federal law. And and, and what do the Republicans do? What's their bold, strong, brash answer to this insane radicalism? They say, hey, 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 hey. We'll go along with all of that. Just give us a few exceptions. And that's what the Fairness for All Act was. The Fairness for All Act did exactly the same thing that the Equality Act did. The Fairness for All Act, supported by Republicans, said, we're going to obliterate the distinction between men and women. And if you say that men are not women and women are not men, then if you act on that, then you're violating federal law. Except certain religious organizations can get a pass. Not good enough, guys. Not good enough. With Republicans like that, who needs Democrats? So the good news is Elise Stefanik, who replaced Liz Cheney as the GOP caucus chairman, uh, she's just pulled her support for the uh, bill. Every other Republican co-sponsor should as well. This thing should be deader than disco. It is totally unacceptable. If any Republican is still supporting this monstrosity of a law, that Republican should be booted out of office, period. Punto e basta, it's just completely, completely unacceptable. Some Republicans have not been confused on this. Some Republicans have been right on this issue from the beginning. I'm looking down at my man, Ron DeSantis, down in in Florida, who, as far as the governors are concerned, is really leading on these issues. Ron DeSantis is now backing a bill in Florida that will prevent teachers from indoctrinating little kids 
into crazy, radical sexual ideologies. And the left is furious about this. The left is calling it the don't say gay bill, and they are turning all of their fire up to and including the White House on this law. This is not the only bill or the only effort we're seeing across the country to uh, to really uh, regulate what students can or cannot read, what they can or cannot learn, and most troubling, who they can or cannot be. Uh, as I think you saw in the president's treat, uh, tweet, um, it's cruel, it's harmful, um, and uh, you know it is certainly something that is not helping. Uh, you know, young people who are members of the LGBTQI plus community who are already vulnerable, are already being bullied. I think the president felt it was important to speak out. Um, but in terms of specific actions, uh, you know, we're going to continue to voice our strong views on this. It's significant the president did that. And uh, if there's any additional steps, I'll, I'll let you know. So what does the bill actually do? Not what Jen Psaki says it does. What does it actually do? It orders that schools, quote, may not encourage classroom discussion about sexual orientation or gender identity in primary schools or in a manner that is not age appropriate or developmentally appropriate for students. We are talking not about whether 18 year olds are allowed to say the word gay. The word gay obviously does not appear in the bill. So the bill does not say gay. We're talking about elementary school students. Specifically, we're talking about kindergarten to third grade. Do you think that teachers should be allowed to tell your five-year-old son, Johnny, that he's really Jane? Do you think that teachers should be allowed, without your consent, completely absent your input, to tell your five-year-old son that he's really your daughter or not? The key here to her attack on this bill is she said it's an attack on on allowing these kids to be who they are. LGBTQ, LMNOP youth. But we're talking about five-year-olds to eight-year-olds. Allow the five-year-old to be a pansexual, transsexual, lesbian, demi. What sick nonsense are you talking? What are you? I know what you're smoking. You must be smoking crack because that's the policy from the White House now. And you would have to be smoking crack to believe this stuff. It's it's actually an important question. It says, you're telling me, you're telling me Floridians, you're telling me Ron DeSantis, that five-year-olds should not be allowed to be the transsexuals that they are? No. Well, what is at issue, Jen? is what people are. That's what it comes down to. When I, when I say all politics ultimately is religious, this is what I'm talking about. When we're talking about politics, ultimately we're going to get down to what is a human person? What is our relationship to each other? What is our relationship to our country? And what is our relationship to our maker? And the question is that what are we? In, in my view, we are body and soul inextricably linked while we're here on earth. And our souls and our bodies both matter and they've got something to do with one another. In this, by the way, is not some crazy fringe radical view. This is what every single person on earth (laughs) in our civilization thought for pretty much the whole history of our civilization uh, until five minutes ago. The view that Jen Psaki is espousing and just assuming to be true is that our bodies have nothing to do with who we are. Who we really are has absolutely nothing to do with our physical selves. That is a false view. It's an insane view and it's an extremely novel radical view. But she's just assuming that. And what Ron DeSantis is doing, he's not even defining who we are in in this law. He's just saying, look, we're we're not going to introduce these crazy, radical, new, insane ideologies to five-year-olds. We're going to wait until they turn nine. Okay. We're going to wait until they turn 10 and then they can hear all this lunatic stuff and I guess come to their own conclusions. Frankly, I wish the bill went further. I wish the bill outlawed (laughs) the teaching of transgenderism, period, because transgenderism is a delusion. It's fake. It's a false anthropology. It's a false account of what a human being is. And we shouldn't educate people in that because we'll be educating them in falsehood. And that's no education at all. That's not going to liberate you as education is supposed to do. It's going to enslave you to fantasy. So, What DeSantis is doing, I applaud it. It's a good first step. We've got to go further, folks. Look how far the left has gone. They're whining and crying and complaining 
that we're not allowed to, we're not allowing them to trans the five-year-olds, the five-year-olds. That's, that's the degree of radicalism here. I think maybe we've got to turn up our confidence a little bit too. I think maybe we've got to turn up our moral clarity a little bit too. Because schools are shaping kids' views, not just of history and reading, writing, and arithmetic, but of themselves and of sex. New report out, 40% of Gen Z identify as LGBTQ. There's a study just came out of Barna. Barna stuff. Well, I guess it, it came out a little while ago, but it's making the rounds again because of these new laws. 30% of millennials identify as LGBTQ, whatever the rest of the letters are. 40% of Zoomers, the younger generation, identify as LGBTQ, whatever the rest of the letters are. When you just look at the general population, identification with LGBTQ, LMNOP, is 6%. So how did we go, and it's much lower among cer- certain age groups. So how did we go from 6% to 40%? What the left used to tell you is, look, you're just born this way. You're born this way. You can never change your sexual desires or orientation or then later gender. You can't change it. Now, they t- now it's a little different because they're saying not only can you change your sexual desires, you can change your whole sex. You can, if you're a man, you can become a woman. But so it's, it's a little bit confused. But the one thing we were, we were told is that none of this has anything to do with culture. None of this has anything to do with nurture. None of this has anything to do with education. Can't change who we, it's just who we are is just deep, deep, deep down. So my question then is, how did we go from 6% to 40%? Either Alex Jones is right and there's just something in the water, and they're not only turning the frickin' frogs gay, but they're turning everyone else gay too. I, it's either that, or, and I, actually he was right about the frogs, so I don't know, all right, I'll, I'll uh, withhold judgment. Or what I think is probably more likely, culture obviously matters, and culture shapes the way, that, and education, most importantly, shapes the way we view the world, shapes the way we view ourselves. It even helps to shape our desires right? Little kids desire to just eat cookies all the time and have no self-control. And then through education, as they grow and mature, their tastes change, their desires change, and their discipline changes as well. Or at least it used to. Now we put education completely in the opposite direction to uh, not to cultivate the higher things in the rational will, but to cultivate all sorts of crazy, beyond sex, just to cultivate all sorts of crazy, crazy sorts of desires. If that is the case, that the culture and the education shapes it, then obviously we've got to have a say in education. Then obviously, if, the, if education could convince a, a whole, half a generation of, of Americans that they're not the sex that they say that they are, they're, they're, they're not the sex that they actually are and they're a com- completely different sex or their sexual desires are all kind of kooky, if it can do that, then it can go in the other direction too, can it? The, I'm, I'm actually not even all that surprised by these very high numbers, 30, 40%. What this tells me is that young people are right now, as they always are, searching for meaning. They're searching for truth. They're very confused. They don't have all the answers. And they're just trying to grab on to the things that are deeper. Not merely the physical things of this world, but what's it all about? What are we here for? What am I? You know, all the questions the young people ask. And they used to have those questions answered by, by true religion and by true philosophy and by sophisticated, serious thinking. And now they're having those questions answered by radical leftist ideologues who are extremely shallow in their thought and who are leading them down a very bad path and telling them actually all you, all you are is your appetites. All you are is either your flesh or not your flesh. All you, they're, they're not getting very good answers there. And we, and young people have a right to the truth and we ought to present it to them in schools. It's very hard. Not only is it hard because the teacher unions keep true things out of the classroom, but it's, it's hard to teach people when everyone is muzzled up. And the, the masking in schools shows no signs of going away. The head of the teacher union the National Teacher Union, uh, Randy Weingarten, just went on MSNBC. She was asked, hey, hold on, when, when are you going to let the kids stop muzzling themselves? We all saw that picture of Stacey Abrams the other day 
where just Stacey Abrams shows up. She's smiling, grinning ear to ear, but she forces all the kids to be masked around her, which has always been the case. The Democrats don't follow their own mask rules, but they force everyone else to, and they whine and complain and punish you if you violate them. One set of rules for me, another one for thee. And so in the wake of this, Weingarten is asked, when are the kids going to be able to take the masks off? She says in very clever political speak, she basically says, no time soon. What Dr. McBride just told us about masks not particularly being effective for children, what's the argument against taking off masks in schools? Well, the argument is that you have, well, let me just say this. I am in favor of an off-ramp on masks. Right. The real issue becomes, are, is, the, is, is the spread low enough so that there's no dissemination or transmission in schools. And it's not the teachers transmitting to kids. Um, it's more kids and kids, particularly in elementary schools right now. And so the question really becomes, do we have, that's why I like what Massachusetts has done, because what they've said is that on a school by school basis, they said if there's 80% vaccination rates, then those schools can lift the mandates. Okay, so by the end, she gives you a little hope. She says, well, well look, here's something that the school said, and I think this is kind of nice. You know, Once we have 80% vaccination, then likely we'll be able to lift the mandates. But that's not the criterion that she insists on, right? It's, she's using the 80% as an example. But what she actually says is, well, we're, we're going to take the masks away when there's no transmission. And then she sort of insinuates that, well, if we get 80% vaccination, then, then probably we'll have no transmission. Except, except we won't. Except we know from Dr. Fauci and Rochelle Walensky and Joe Biden now and all of, the, all of the medical experts and politicians who had previously told us that the COVID vaccines would stop transmission of the virus, we now know it doesn't stop transmission. So you can get the 80% vaccination. It's still going to be transmitted. COVID's just here. It's like saying, well, we're going we're gonna to go back to school. We're going to take the masks off when there's zero flu. What do you mean zero? There's never going to be zero flu. And so according to Weingarten's own logic, the kids are never taking the masks off until we force the issue, until we go in and we wield political power and we say, no, I don't care what you say, Weingarten. I don't care what you say, teachers. I don't care what you say, administrators. We're, we're going to do this. We are going to have a say in our kids' education first and in our local communities and in our national government. I remind you before we go, get your congressman to co-sponsor the Michael Knowles Federal Health Protection Pledge. House Concurrent Resolution 71, co-sponsor it right now. We'll see you tomorrow. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Ben Davies. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Supervising producer, Mathis Glover. Production manager, Pavel Vidovsky. Editor and associate producer, Danny D'Amico. Associate producer, Justine Turley. Audio mixer, Mike Coromina. And hair and makeup by Cherokee Hart. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2022.
daughter. She's very pretty.